So we are on a quest to discuss sort of how thick, how pervasive, how much set is there in a generic subset of the real numbers. And so far, we've had an idea of measuring the width of a set, which we're ultimately going to call the Lebesgue measure of a set, which is not topological, so we're not really going to do much with that. And we've also seen a notion of connectedness, that somehow the thickest kinds of sets are, as subsets of the real line, the intervals. And intervals are connected, and connected subsets of the real numbers are intervals. The next place I want to go is to revive a notion that we might have seen in first semester real analysis, which is the notion of density. So what are dense sets in the real numbers? What do they look like? And then what might be at the other end of that spectrum of denseness? What are the least dense sets that exist that we're ultimately going to call the nowhere dense sets? So let's take a look at how those work, starting with thinking again about how do we situate various topological properties on a spectrum? specifically when one end of that spectrum are the open sets. So we've already seen one example of a spectrum, a topological spectrum, where open sets are at one end, closed sets are at the other end. So in, in some way, closeness is at the, the opposite end of this spectrum from openness, and that spectrum is determined by how much of the boundary of my set do I include. On the one end are the open sets whose boundaries are totally disjoint from them, on the other end are the closed sets whose boundary is a subset of them. And so if I contain none of my boundary points, I'm an open set. If I contain all of my boundary points, I'm a closed set. But what we want to do here is think about some other ways of understanding what another opposite of an open set might be. Because somehow the open sets in the real line are the ones that contain open intervals. And those open intervals are friendly, connected, they're very thick. They're like the thickest kinds of subsets that we can have. So if I'm looking for something at the opposite end of that spectrum, realizing that there's a lot of stuff in between both ends of any one of my given spectra. Right? If I'm looking for something that's a different kind of opposite of open sets, maybe instead of thinking about boundary points, if my concern is somehow thinking about the, uh, the presence or absence of open intervals, I should be thinking about interior points instead of thinking about boundary points. So what kind of spectrum could we set up that has open sets on one end, and on the other end of the spectrum has sort of a set that has the opposite relationship with its interior points from open sets. Remember, a set by definition is open in a metric topology if all of its points are interior to it. And so at the other end of the spectrum should be some kind of set where none of its points are interior points. But that's probably not what we mean by a closed set, because we can think of a lot of examples of closed sets that do have some interior points. Right? Any closed interval, let's say the closed interval from 0 to 1, has a ton of interior points. And so at the other end of the spectrum of interiorality are going to be sets that have no interior points at all, right? and yet which are still not empty. So one example that comes to my mind is a discrete set, like the set of integers as a subset of the real line. None of the points in that set are interior because they're all isolated. Right? So if all of the points in my set are isolated, none of them are going to be interior points. But somehow that doesn't seem to fully capture the topological reality of what would be at the other end of that spectrum. We're going to call the sets at the other end of the spectrum that have no interior points. I am going to call them scarce. I don't think this is a term that's in, in common use in topology or analysis, so take that with a grain of salt if you go look at other resources. But just to have a convenient term for it, I'm going to call those the scarce sets. There are no open intervals at all contained within uh, as a subset of the scarce set. None of its points are interior points. So another way to say that is that the interior of a scarce set is empty. It's the empty set. So how do we understand the scarce sets? What might be some examples? Well, as a subset of the real line, a scarce set is just one that contains no open interval subsets. So here's an example. If I take all of the rational numbers between 0 and 1, inclusive of the endpoints, even though that doesn't really matter, I'm going to get a scarce set. And the reason I get a scarce set in this example is that the rational numbers don't contain any open interval subsets at all. Right? So if I plant myself at any rational number in between 0 and 1 and I reach out my epsilon arms, I'm always going to touch something that's irrational. Just because the irrationals are dense within the real numbers and the rationals are dense within the rational numbers, or within the real numbers, right? And so there's no way for me, if I'm rational, to reach out my epsilon arms any positive amount of distance and not touch something that's rational but also something that's irrational. And so this set is a scarce set. And in fact, as a subset of the real numbers, a subset is scarce if and only if its complement, E complement, is a dense subset of the reals. So being scarce in the real line means having a dense complement 
And the idea behind that argument right, is that if E is a scarce set, that means that my epsilon arms, if I'm standing at a point of E, are always going to reach a point outside of E. But then if we just flip the script and imagine some point outside of E, that point outside of E can always be reached by a point of E um, if uh, E is a scarce set. Um, and so sort of the, the primary example that comes to mind here is the relationship between the rational numbers and the irrational numbers as subsets of the real line. And we might think, is this really the opposite that we're looking for? Because, for example, both the rational numbers and the irrational numbers as subsets of the reals, they're both scarce sets. Right? Both of them have empty interior. There is no open interval of the real line that consists entirely of rational numbers. There is also no open interval of the real line that consists entirely of irrational numbers. So both the rationals and the irrationals are scarce. And so that's not a great notion of sort of thickness. Because what happens if I take the union? of these two scarce sets with one another. Q is scarce, R minus Q is scarce, but their union is the entire real line, which is not a scarce set at all. It contains a ton of open intervals. And so if scarceness is our sort of measurement of the opposite end of openness, right? sort of the least kind of open sets from a how many open intervals do we contain perspective, scarce doesn't seem to quite do it because scarceness can be destroyed even just in the union of two scarce sets. So we need something that's a little bit stronger, something that has a little bit more teeth to it. So to get us a slightly stronger notion of sort of having no open intervals as part of my set, I want to do that in a way that rules out the rational numbers as a kind of set that we could work with here. Right? So the rational numbers as a subset of the reals are scarce, but so was the irrationals, right? Um, and so the union of the two of them is no longer scarce. So I want a kind of notion of the opposite of open sets that's even more empty, even more spread apart than the scarce sets are. So how do we create more emptiness? The problem with the rational numbers is that they can accumulate among one another, right? There's, they're so thick, the rational numbers were dense, and so they accumulate on themselves. They also accumulate on any uh, uh, irrational number outside of them. So if I want to rule out that kind of behavior, we should be looking for sets that are so empty that not only do they contain no open interval subsets, but they also don't accumulate on anything at all. Right? So that's how we're going to create more openness. To put that on a firm topological foundation, the problem with the rational numbers is that the points were too close together so that I could find limits of rational number sequences which converge in fact, on any real number at all, right? Because the rationals are dense within the reals. And so if I want to rule that out, what I want to avoid is I want to avoid the closure of my set filling in an open interval. I want not only for the set itself to have no open interval subsets, but I also want it not to have any open interval subsets in its closure either. Because if its closure can have an open interval subset, then it's going to sort of be too thick, right, for what we're trying to do here. And so I want to insist not that E has no interior points, but I also want to insist that the closure of E has no interior points. To ensure that the closure never fills in an open interval, we're just going to replace all of the E's in my definition of scarce with E closure instead. And in doing so, we get the stronger notion that actually is friendlier to work with. We call these the nowhere dense sets. So nowhere dense sets of uh, topological space are those that not only don't contain any interior points, but neither does their closure contain any points that are interior to their closure. So the interior of the closure is empty, not just the interior of the original set. So nowhere dense in this way lives at the opposite end of the interiorality spectrum from open sets. Open sets have all of their points being interior. Nowhere dense not only have no interior points of their own, but the closure doesn't have any interior points either. And so what happens with nowhere dense sets is that they're going to avoid this problem that we had with scarce sets. Remember, the rationals and the irrationals were both scarce. They both have empty interior. But when I take their union, I get the entire real line, which definitely does not have an empty interior. Right? It has a ton of interior points. All of its points are interior. In fact, it's an open set. Right? But nowhere dense sets, on the other hand, are going to be preserved in unions most of the time. The theorem that we can say is if I have a finite collection of nowhere dense sets in a topological space, then the union of that finite collection is also a nowhere dense set. If none of these sets E1 up through En have interior points in their closure, 
then neither will the union. And the idea behind that argument is that if I look at the closure of the union of these sets, the closure of a union is actually the union of the closures. And for that reason, if I pick an arbitrary element in the closure of the union, if x is interior to the closure of the union, then we're going to be able to conclude that x must have been interior to one of the closures of the EIs from 1 up to n. But if those sets were nowhere dense, that's not possible. And so if I have a finite collection of nowhere dense sets and I take their union, that union is going to be nowhere dense. Well, just like a lot of topological properties, what we can take for granted in a finite union is not necessarily always true in an infinite union. This piece of the argument can fail. If I have an infinite collection of nowhere dense sets and I union them all together, that union might not, in fact, be nowhere dense. But we still like to think about what countably infinite unions of nowhere dense sets might look like. So we give them a different name. We call them meager. So a meager subset of a topological space is just a countably infinite union of nowhere dense sets. This, by the way, is going to be a really, really useful way for us to talk about differences between topological spaces. Um, in particular, for some topological spaces, we will be able to have a collection of nowhere dense subsets whose union is a meager set, but which contains the entire topological space. But in other topological spaces, that cannot happen. And that's a difference in what's called topological category between those two sets. So we like nowhere dense sets because they're sort of at the opposite end of this interiorality spectrum. Not only do they contain no interior points, but neither do they have a closure which contains any interior points. And if I take a, a, a countably infinite collection of nowhere dense sets and I take the union of them together, we might not have a nowhere dense set anymore, but we still have something that's probably pretty sparse in some way. We call it a meager set. So this is one way of thinking about how thick a set is from a density perspective. In the last video, let's take a look at some other ways of thinking of the other end of the spectrum from openness. They're going to give us one more way of talking about topological thickness of a set.